You're listening to the BBM Global Network with 25 years in broadcast audio and video production. Our passionate team creates content and marketing for the world of Internet talk radio. If you've got a passion, come join us at BBMGlobalNetwork.com. The BBM Global Network. Your voice is now heard. Used to be an addict, now he's substance free. Telling all about his crazy journey. Take off that mask and take on your addiction. Alan Charles, author and keynote speaker on drug abuse and prevention, and the host of The Alan Charles Show, is here to bring hope to the hopeless as he shares his unbelievable luck at surviving a 24 year drug addiction. Alan's raw honesty and courageous heart breaks the stigma of addiction and offers a unique perspective into the mind of an addict. So now, please welcome the host of The Alan Charles Show, Alan Charles. He's given us the real story, The Alan Charles Show. Ups and downs, losing jobs and the glory, The Alan Charles Show. He helps others avoid that purgatory. The Alan Charles Show. Good evening and welcome. This is indeed the Alan Charles Show, live from New York City on the BBM Global Network at TuneIn Radio. And I am your host, Alan Charles. Welcome to a very warm 84 degrees here in New York City. We are live and we are here to talk about addiction, recovery, and reality. We give it to you straight. So glad that you're here to join me tonight. And uh, we have a very interesting show. We're going to we're going to address racism in recovery and it's an interesting topic. Um, I combed, God, to do the research. There were so many different leads and so many different things to read and to figure out what made sense, what what things I really wanted to share, what the numbers look like, and with everything that's going on with Black Lives Matter and all the protests going on, uh, this is a good time to address this because there are some differences and challenges, and we will get into all of that as we move on with our show tonight. Um, let's see. So I usually tell you a little bit of how, how I got here. Um, I... Let's see. The, the short version of this is um, I had a dysfunctional childhood. Um, fast forward through a lot of um, crazy, uh, God, yelling, screaming, um, police getting called. Um, it was just a crazy mess living in my house on a regular basis. So I finally escaped, went to college, um, had a dream to play professional baseball, which I eventually did and signed a contract and played in the Dominican Republic. Um, and I was injured. So after my baseball career was over, I met somebody who I fell in love with and it was the first relationship first time I was really in love with anybody and that broke up pretty quickly so within a year I lost baseball and I lost my first love and for whatever reason I ended up trying cocaine for the first time at 24 years old and I was addicted from that very first line so oh god 24 years I died I God knows how many overdoses. I had some great things happen, and I had some of the worst things happen that I wouldn't even wish on my enemy. So uh, somehow I was given the miracle of finally getting sober after 24 years of addiction and use. Um, I should not be here, but thank God I was able to get sober from there 
you know, I got my kids back. I, I got to, I got employable again. I started to build my life back and it took quite some time to get people's trust back. But eventually I did. And after I was sober for five years, just all the craziness that I had going on and just a very action filled life with a lot of interesting and non-believable things that have happened to me. Um, I was, uh, it was suggested to write a book, which I did. And, uh, I spent three years writing the book and, um, book came out and, uh, it was published. I ended up, uh, did pretty well. I spoke uh, around the country and from all the social media posting that led me here to Bold Brave Media. So here we are. Um, and that's how we got here. And I am here to help you. We come here every Thursday and you're in the right place. This is the no stigma zone. And that's going to be a very big topic that we're going to be talking about because stigma plays a large part of why everybody doesn't want to go get help or that's not the first thing on somebody's mind. Let me go to a rehab and so that everybody else will know that I am an alcoholic and or an addict. That's that's not some of the things we think about. So we're going to talk about that. We'll get to that in a little bit. But first, Sean, let's go to the news. And today, you know what? Congratulations, professional golfer Chris Kirk. He considered quitting golf about a year ago. The demons that controlled his life sent him spiraling out of control as he dealt with the pressure with a game that was never supposed to be that difficult. He thought he found resolution in the bottle. Kirk continues his professional and personal comeback Saturday afternoon with a three-foot birdie putt on the 72nd hole to win the King and Bear Classic at World Golf Village. He's a four-time winner on the PGA Tour, and he won for the first time since, uh, let's see, he won a match in Texas in 2015, the Charles Schwab Challenge in Fort Worth, Texas in 2015. And um, it was pretty incredible. Kirk finished with a 5 under 67 for a four day total of 26 under 262. The victory was worth $108,000, but what it meant to his recovery was priceless. And uh, let's give you some quotes from Kirk. Uh, it gives me a deeper sense of appreciation and gratitude for everything. Kirk said, I'm a completely different person than I was two years ago. When you're faced with a situation that you're completely out of control of your own life, it changes things. Kirk took on an indefinite leave of absence from the tour a year ago to deal with his drinking problem and depression. He quickly learned the answers couldn't be found in a cocktail or on a golf course. I didn't touch a club for three and a half months and was able to get some help, thankfully, and get myself back on the right track, he said. I think my alcoholism may have happened to me no matter what, but part of it was being on the road away from my family, which I hated. The pressure of golf and trying to maintain a high level of playing became too much for me. I hate that it did, but taking the break and getting some help gave me some perspective that made this an important decision. Yes, it's my career and my passion and what I love to do, but there are bigger things in life. I can't wait to get home and give my wife and three boys a hug, and that's what I care more about now. It's amazing seeing the complete shift in my mentality as far as that's concerned. So, very cool. Congratulations. Uh, Keep on doing what you're doing. We hope you win a lot more tournaments, and uh, good luck to Chris Kirk. Um, Our second story is about Miley Cyrus, and uh, Miley, who we know, who was uh, formerly of Hannah Montana fame in Disney, where she took... um, Kind of your girl next door, goofy, but pretty and cute, nice person um, 
attitude on Hannah Montana. She got pretty wild. And uh, for most of you have seen that, you know, she's kind of grown up right in front of us. And um, some of the craziness and, you know, whether it was drugs or her sexuality or all the different things that she was out there with boundaries and stuff like that. Well, the good news is, oh, you know what? Let's take a break, and I'll give you the good news when we get back. You don't want to miss it. You're listening to The Alan and Charles Show live on the BBM Global Network and TuneIn Radio. We'll be right back. If you seek a courageous advocate, prepare to champion your rights with consumer service agencies that support aging populations, Carol Ann Hamilton is the one for you. Carol Ann is an elder care coach, author, and speaker with a quarter million hours lived experience successfully supporting unculpable aging parents. As a result of a challenging journey, Carol Ann revolutionizes how stressed out caregivers restore serenity to their worlds. She also brings over 25 years of change management expertise in Fortune 500 settings to catalyze urgent transformation within the elder care industry. Carol Ann is a popular speaker at conferences across North America. She has appeared via TV, radio, and print globally. Now you can tune in weekly to get a dose of her inspiration plus down-to-earth advice to cope with even the most difficult aging parents. Listen Wednesdays at 9 a.m. Eastern on Bold Brave Media and TuneIn Radio. Dr. R.C. will share extraordinary resources and services that promote educational success as well as making a difference in the lives of all social workers as well as the lives of children, adolescents, and teens of today. She will have open discussions addressing many of the issues that we face about our youth and how being employed in the uniquely skilled profession of social work for over 18 years has taught invaluable lessons through her personal experiences. She will also provide real-life facts, examples, and personal stories that will confirm that why serving as a child advocate is extremely beneficial when addressing the needs of the whole child. Listen live Saturdays, 10 a.m. Eastern on the BBM Global Network and tune in radio as Dr. R.C. will provide thought-provoking information that will empower, encourage, and strengthen students, families, and communities across our nation. You can also visit her at soarwithkatie.com. Welcome back to the Alan Charles Show live on the BBM Global Network at TuneIn Radio. And I'm your host, Alan Charles. And before we went to break, I, we were doing the news and we were started to do a story on Miley Cyrus. And those of you that uh, most of you probably know who Miley is, she's grown up with us and she had a show, Hannah Montana, and has an incredible singing career and was you know, feeling her oats and going through the, you know, her teen, late teens and early 20s and pretty wild and doing some wild stuff. But the good news is, is, well, first I should tell you that before this whole pandemic hit, she had a role um, in the Netflix anthology series Black Mirror, where she played Ashley O, a seemingly happy pop star who wants to move on from her controlling manager, her Aunt Catherine. When her aunt slips too many pills, Ashley falls into a coma. A fan helps her wake up and break free. Cyrus is being submitted for Emmy consideration in her guest actress appearance in the drama series. So she talked a little about that, but then she started to share about sobriety. And she surprisingly said, I've been sober for the past six months. At the beginning, it was just about this vocal surgery and she shared that she was having this vocal surgery. She's been singing since she's four or five years old. So she felt it was a matter of time, but what she shared, she thought she was going to stop because of the vocal surgery, but you know, maybe that was temporary. She said, but I had been thinking a lot about my mother. My mom was adopted and I inherited some of the feelings that she had, the abandonment feelings and wanting to prove you're wanted and valuable. My dad's parents divorced when I was three. So my dad raised them when he was three. So my dad raised himself. I did a lot of family history, which has a lot of addiction and mental health challenges. So just going through that and asking, why am I the way I 
I am, by understanding the past, we understand the present and the future much more clearly. I think therapy is great. So congratulations, uh, six months sober. And um, let's see, anything else that we want to wish her? Um, she, let's see. Oh, she did say, one of her favorite interviews, she said, was when she said, anyone that smokes weed is a dummy. The one that I love sent to my parents. <laughs> that one I sent to my parents, who are big stoners. Every now and then, it's been really important for me over the last year of living a sober lifestyle because I've really wanted to polish up my craft. I had really big vocal surgery in November, and I had freaking four weeks where I wasn't even allowed to talk. I was so ripped, writing on the whiteboard, yelling at everybody. I had this one big bicep from just yelling at mom and still trying to do the meetings. But it prepared me for the stillness and the quietness. So, aw, our Hannah Montana is growing up and she got sober. So let's uh, let's hope uh, Miley continues to move forward with her recovery and to influence uh, some of our younger people. So what do we have to talk to about today? Well, we're here to talk about recovery and race. And one of the topics that I'm pretty familiar with um, there are reports that show that blacks do not seek recovery nearly as much as white people. There are other reports that talk about blacks not completing recovery or not staying long enough. Um, to me, there's going to, we're going to give you and we're going to get into some of the reasons of why this is happening. Now, I just want to make this clear. Everything I'm sharing tonight are my own thoughts, my own research. It's not my information, but I am using it. Um, I've checked my sources. I've double checked and triple checked some of the numbers. So I, I'm talking from an educated place, but I'm also going to give you my personal experience um, talking about rehabs. I have been in four inpatient rehabs, and I've been in 15, 17 outpatient programs. So I've had a lot of experience, and they've been all around the country. So I haven't just been in one area um, that maybe was affecting one race more than another. I've uh, been an equal opportunity rehab attender. So I've, I've attended in many states. And, well, one of the early um, rehabs that I went to. You know what? I'm just going to say it's in Rhinebeck, New York. If that's the only one in Rhinebeck, New York, so be it. And maybe it has changed since I was there. So let me figure this out. I had just gotten married to my wife, Stacy, who I had two children with. But it was early on in our marriage. We got married married in March of 2001. And I believe it was by July. So what's that, about four months? By July, I had continued to use cocaine during the beginning of my marriage because I was already addicted and was hiding it because I didn't really believe that I had a problem at that point. So here I am, I'm using, I'm disappearing, I'm breaking somebody's heart. I'm just, I don't know, I'm just a shell inside. And I was like that for a long time. I was lost. And so finally, I'm talking to my wife and I say, fine, I'll go to rehab, I'll go to rehab. And I haven't been with this company for that long. I was, well, actually I was, I was there like, I was less than a year, but I was with AOL and I got this wonderful job working for AOL before they merged with Time Warner and AOL was the 800 pound gorilla. And I really enjoyed my job and enjoyed what I was doing, but I had this addiction that I could not handle and it was progressive and anything else in my life the cocaine use took precedence and unfortunately that's where the addiction was so I agreed to go to this rehab up in Rhinebeck New York and you know I, I don't know one rehab from another that was the rehab that my insurance said they would pay for so I get up there and 
you know, just to, to give you a general idea, and I've shared this before if, if you're new to my show, um, I grew up in Yonkers, New York, and at the time, there were not a lot of black people, especially in the area of Yonkers that I lived. So, you know, my interaction with African Americans and blacks were, were minimal, but I didn't seem to have any prejudice. Let's take a quick break. You don't want to miss the rest of this story. You're listening to the Alan Charles Show. We're live on the BBM Global Network and TuneIn Radio. We will be right back. What if there were a super tiny device that could diagnose the brain and is smaller than a single human hair? What if you could see inside the brain to help an epilepsy patient during surgery or to help the fight against Parkinson's disease? Dr. Patricia Broderick is proud to announce the Broderick Probe, a biomedical and electronic breakthrough. Imagine a probe to help with the understanding and potential cure of brain-related diseases. To learn more, listen live to the Easy Sense Radio Show with host Dr. Broderick, Wednesdays, 7 p.m. Eastern, on the Bold Brave Media Network and TuneIn Radio. And to help support the Broderick Foundation, please go to Easy easysense.com and learn how with your help we can fight these horrific brain disorders that's easysense.com to learn more and help support the broderick foundation have you ever felt like no one is listening or you're not getting the honest attention you deserve do you even know the kind of attention you want or need you are not alone alice aspen march is here to help Thanks to Alice, through her epiphany and research over the word attention, there are solutions to the attention dilemma. Worldwide audiences have been enthralled and engaged for over 40 years with her visionary and pioneering observations. The kind of attention we get and give is vital to improving our lives and society. Alice and her weekly guests review game-changing insights for transforming and improving our understanding of attention, providing techniques for creating healthier and empowering behavior. Get a new perspective on a mainstream word. Tune into Why Our Attention Matters for fresh and thought-provoking conversations every Tuesday at 3 p.m. Eastern on BoldBraveMedia.com and the TuneIn Radio app. Welcome back. We're here in live in New York City. You're listening to the Alan Charles Show live on the BBM Global Network and TuneIn Radio. And I'm your host, Alan Charles. And before we went to break, I started to tell you a little story about one of the early rehabs that I went to. Um, I just shared that I had grown up in Yonkers. And, well, first of all, the show tonight is in the racial um, inequality of what's going on in rehabs. And, you know, we're talking about race and recovery and why do rehab centers have a disparity in the patients they treat. Reports show that both blacks and other minorities don't seek recovery nearly as much as white people. And so I'm sharing a personal experience where one of these earlier rehabs, um, and I grew up in, in a very white area, so I didn't have a lot of, I don't know, a couple of friends growing up that were black that lived in our area. And then even my high school, we didn't have a lot, but I, it was nothing to me. It was like, okay, there's black kids, there's Asian kids. I mean, you know, I'm a white kid. Um, and I had a lot of fear and anxiety. So I wasn't worried about race and different things. I was more worried that I'm not as good as anybody else, or I'm not, smart enough or nobody likes me or if I say something um you know people are going to think I'm an idiot they you know just be quiet and say what people want you to hear and that was that was how I lived so I didn't have room in my head for racism and, and prejudice I was too worried about what was happening to me and uh so here I am and we fast forward and I, and I tell my wife I'm willing I want to go get help I'm gun ho I, I say I want to get better and she takes me up to Rhinebeck and as I am checking in I notice that 
you know, staff is half white, half African American, maybe one or two Asians, and they check me in, and my wife leaves. And so now they bring me to my room, and they're basically cots, three cots to a room, and and now I'm starting to notice that I may be the only white guy in here. And to be honest, it was very uncomfortable. I had never been in a situation like that. Not so much that I was afraid of black people. It was just it felt uncomfortable. And you know what? I had the same um, set of, not the same set of circumstances. What's a better way to say this? I had the same kind of overall situation that LeBron James speaks about you know, a few years ago and and actually made public news. And, um, you know, I I see it making headlines and and they took his 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 um, his talking about growing up in black areas. And then when he transferred or went to a white high school because of basketball and he told how he felt and having to deal with white people and never dealing with white people before and feeling uncomfortable and they cut up because that was on a television show that he was doing that he talked about it and I went back because I didn't hear it live and I listened to the entire show and his quotes were taken out of context so just as I am sharing with you it's not a prejudicial thing. I just felt uncomfortable. I had never been in a place that had 200 black people and myself. So that was just the way it is. And at first I felt uncomfortable. And LeBron talked about the same thing, except they took his quotes and they turned it into that he was being racist against whites, that he wanted nothing to do with whites. And that was so far from what he said. So Here I am, and I'm in that same situation. So, I don't know. I don't think I slept well the first night, but eventually, uh, my problem is I'm dealing with drugs. Last thing I need to do is to worry about other people and, and to feel uncomfortable. So, at that point, I just started to say, listen, I'm here. I might as well enjoy it. I might as well do whatever I needed to do. And I sucked it up and I built relationships and I had some friends and guys and women that were looking out for me and they would hug. We'd hug after our our sessions. And, you know, it was really good. And I was there for 13 days. And then the insurance company said they weren't going to, they stopped paying. They decided that they weren't going to pay anymore. Now, What I didn't mention is what I was told was that a lot of the people that were in the facility were people from New York City that had been arrested. And as part of their, I don't know if it was a plea sentence or whatever the result of whatever they their charges and decisions, they were sent to this rehab. So. I don't know if it was 70% people from that were should be in jail that were there. So when I heard that, that was a little concerning because I I didn't know, you know, if they were dangerous people. You know, I didn't think there were any killers there. But, you know, I'm I'm just getting all this stuff going through my head. You know, I'm living there and I don't have many belongings. So there was nothing to really worry about. And I wasn't worried. I felt safe after the first night. And the people that the two guys that were in my room were good guys. And we would have conversations. And, you know, I I opened up a little as little as I as much as I'm capable of opening up, especially then I'm a lot better now. But back in those days, you couldn't get a word out of me. And um, so it was it was it was a great experience. Now, what I have to tell you is going through that experience at that facility, there were people being helped. There were a lot of people. Were they overcrowded? I don't know if we were overcrowded, but I would guess we were probably at capacity. It was full. Um, But you know what? My experience was great. And I was there, like I said, for 13 days, 
And then the rehab, um, my insurance company decided that they were not paying any more of the therapy, that they had gotten good reports and they felt that was all that I needed. Well, you know what? That's not all that I needed. And I fought that. And I'll finish. The story's going to come to a quick end, but we'll do it when we come back from break. You're listening to The Alan Charles Show live on the BBM Global Network and TuneIn Radio. We will be right back. Tune into It's All About You with host Dr. Martha Latz, a lively weekly broadcast on BBM Global Network, one of the most empowering shows for time-starved, overscheduled multitaskers. The professional expertise of Dr. Latz is directly available live every Thursday at 1 p.m. to answer and address concerns about relationships, life transitions of career, meeting, dating, and committed relationships. It's All About You with Dr. Latz will expand your understanding of career current concerns across your relationships by broadening and expanding possible solutions in developing skills for mutually desired outcomes. Dr. Martha's expertise is as a licensed marriage and family therapist, life, transition coach, and all things to do with communication at work, home, and with friends. Check out her website at auniquetherapycenter.com. Author, radio show host, and coach, John M. Hawkins, reveals strategies to help gain perspective, build confidence, find clarity, achieve goals. John M. Hawkins' new book, Coached to Greatness, Unlock Your Full Potential with Limitless Growth. Published by iUniverse, Hawkins reveals strategies to help readers accomplish more. He believes the book can coach them to greatness. Hawkins says that the best athletes get to the top of their sport with the help of coaches, mentors, and others. He shares guidance that helps readers reflect on what motivates them, rediscover and assess their core values, philosophies, and competencies, find settings that allow them to be the most productive, and track their progress towards accomplishing goals. Listen to John Hawkins' My Strategy, Saturdays, 1 p.m. Eastern, on the BBM Global Network and 2 Tune in radio. Welcome back to the Alan Charles Show. We're live on the BBM Global Network at TuneIn Radio, and I'm your host, Alan Charles. And before we went to break, I was just finish up finishing up a story sharing that uh, I was in a rehab up in Rhinebeck, New York, and uh, I was the one, there may have been one or two other white people, but there were a couple of hundred people in the facility, and most of them were African Americans. And, um, you know, the rehab did well. Um, I was there for 13 days, and like I told, mentioned before, the insurance company got the report, said I was doing well, and they decided I didn't need rehab anymore, and they said that. They weren't paying for anymore. So we came in, I came into the office. They called my ex, my wife to come get me. And she came up to the office and I'm like, it's only 13 days. And so I talked to my wife. I said, listen, I need to get better. Uh, it was the first time I've ever said anything like that. And I'm willing to pay the rest out of my pocket to stay here. So I was there for 13 days. I wanted another 17 days because at a minimum, you should do a 30 day program. Well, the, the facility then turned around and told me that because I was an insurance patient, that they could no longer take self-pay from me, which meant that after the 13 days, it was too late. I couldn't register myself or they will not take my money. So whatever reason that was, so I left the facility and then within three and a half months, I was messed up and back to another facility. So I don't know how the other people fared there. Um, I can't tell you what type of facility they are, but I can tell you that it did help me. And I was there with a very large contingent of African American people. So let's get into this and talk a little bit about this. Now, again, this is my opinion. I'm giving you information of things that I have found online. I've gone to reliable sources. Some of the information you're going to get from Mental Health America, and you can 
Google Mental Health America and look up what they do. They're very active with addiction. Um, and uh, if you're black or African American, that might be a good place for you to start. On the last segment today, I will have some facilities specifically for people of color or minorities to help them to get help. So, so we'll have some numbers you want to stay close by later. Uh, if that fits you or you have somebody dear in your life that you think that might help, uh, it would be a good thing to pass it along. So overall, and it's a combination of things, as we talk about all the time, if somebody has a drug addiction or, or is an alcoholic, it's not that might not necessarily or usually it's not the only problem. There are other things going on with somebody that has some kind of substance addiction. So mental health conditions occur in black and African-American people in America at about the same or a little less than white Americans. However, Historically, black and African-American experience in America has and continues to be characterized by trauma and violence. And more often than their white counterparts, it impacts emotional and mental health of both youth and adults. Now, that's a very powerful statement because we, as this has become a driving um issue here in the United States. This historical dehumanization, oppression, and violence against black and African American people has evolved into present day racism. And that's what we have been talking about. That's what has been going on. And that's what all the protests are about. Hopefully it'll stay peaceful. But structurally, institutionally, and individually, it cultivate a unique mistrust and less affluent community experiences. So let me break this up a little more for you. So characterized by a a myriad of different inadequate access to the delivery of cares and health system, processing dealing with layers of individual trauma on top of new mass traumas like COVID-19, police brutality, it's that, is driving some of it. Its divisive political rhetoric has also been handing compounding layers of complexity for individuals to responsibly manage. So, you know, again, I do not want to get into any political debates. I do not take sides. Um, I grew up a Democrat. I I'm still listed as a Democrat, but I'll vote Republican. I'll vote Democrat, depending on the issues. So I'm in the middle, and it's just I can go on and on. I can do a whole nother show, God knows how many shows, about what is going on in America. Um, One of the things, besides some of the horrific things and we're finally addressing, and hopefully we will make changes that we need to make, But if somebody says something wrong or makes a mistake or has a difference of opinion, they become vilified. And if you're against a certain side, you're either with us or you're against us. It doesn't matter if you believe half of the things that they're saying or – Three quarters of what people are saying. There's certain things going on out there where it's it's an all or nothing mentality, which I think is totally wrong. And the direction in which our country is going is really scary. And there are people that are way above my pay grade that are working on these things. So so that's not something that I'm going to have to handle, especially tonight. But I want to talk a little bit more about the demographics because, OK, so we have this systematic, uh, systemic um, prejudice and structural, institutional and it's individual, and so it just makes for mistrust and less community availability. Now, because of these factors, black and American people are more likely to experience chronic and persistent 
rather than episodic mental health conditions. Yet, hope for recovery should remain as light is shed on these issues and the general public holds accountable policymakers and health systems to evolve better systems which eliminate inequality in mental health services. So let's talk a little bit about the demographics. 13.4% of the U.S. population, or nearly 46 million people, identify themselves as black or African American. Another 2.7% identify as multiracial. So according to most recent sentence data available. 55% of all black and African American people lived in the South. 18% lived in the Midwest. 17% in the Northeast. And 10% in the West. So, you know what? We'll give you some more information, but we're just, we have a quick message from friend of the show, Dwight Gooden, and we will be right back. Hello, this is Doc Gooden at the New York Mets. 1986 World Series champion. You are listening to the Alan Charles Show live on the BBM Global Network and tune in radio with my man, AC. Let's get it. Have you ever wondered why some children recover from their symptoms of autism while others never seem to get any better? After 13 years of research, Karen Thomas has recovered her own son from his symptoms of autism naturally. She now shares how she did it with you in her free webinar so that you can have the right resources and knowledge to help your child. The definition of recovery is to regain health. Karen offers this to you in four stages. Healing the gut, natural heavy metal detoxification, balancing the co-infections of autism, brain support, and repair. Register now for this free webinar to help you know what you can do to help your child to sleep better, be more calm, improve focus, and reach their fullest potential to live a happy, healthy life. Go to naturallyrecoveringautism.com forward slash free workshop empowering parents with the resources to naturally recover autism from a mom who's done it mike zorick a three-time california state champion in greco roman wrestling at 114 pounds mike blind since birth was born in hartford connecticut he was a six-time national placer including two seconds two-thirds and two-fourths he also won the veterans folk style wrestling twice at 152 pounds in all these tournaments he was the only blind competitor Nancy Zorick, a creative spirit whose talents have taken her to the stage and into galleries and exhibitions in several states. Her father, a commercial artist who shared his instruments with his daughter and helped her fine-tune her natural abilities, influenced her decision to follow in his footsteps. Ms. Zorick has enjoyed a fruitful career doing what she loves. Listen Saturday mornings at 12 Eastern for The Nancy and Mike Show for heartwarming stories and interesting talk on the B. BBM Global Network. Welcome back to the Alan Charles Show live on the BBM Global Network and TuneIn Radio. And I'm your host, Alan Charles. And this is where you come every Thursday evening to get your life back to find recovery and to hear what's going on out there and getting it real. I give it to you real. You're in the right place. Stigma free zone, the Alan Shaw show. And we're so glad that you're here. You know what? I I was giving you some specifics, um, giving you percentages of usage and, but I'm going to call an audible and, and go to something a little bit more important. Uh, this segment, we're going to talk about, We're going to give you specific things of dealing why there is a disparity in rehabs, thought process, and what's going on. So African-American youth, let's talk about, let's see. Well, first of all, you know, before we get, okay, 3.3% of African-Americans aged 12 and older had both a substance use disorder and a mental illness, and that was um, a study done in 2018. But racism, discrimination, African-Americans are vulnerable to racism and discrimination, which can lead to stress, poor health, 
diminish well-being. Some African-American adults and children may turn to drugs and alcohol to cope with these stresses. Now, some of this stuff I'm telling you just kind of makes sense. And, but, I'm, you know, I'm going to share everything with you. Now, African-American youth are more likely than white youth to have seen drugs sold in their community. So alcohol, even though African-Americans have a lower rates of binge drinking and alcoholism compared to other ethnic groups, those who become dependent on alcohol tend to experience more severe dependence and a greater number of drinking-related problems. During the 90s and 2000s, alcohol was one of the most commonly reported reasons for African Americans to seek addiction treatment. Then cocaine stepped up, and it was widespread, and the number of African Americans seeking treatment for cocaine abuse has grown has gone down, actually, over the past decade, but they're still twice as likely as other groups to report cocaine-related problems. Crack cocaine, very similar to cocaine. Crack has a reputation for being widely used in the African-American community. Crack is cocaine that has been processed with baking soda or ammonia into a rock form and smoked. African-Americans have higher rates of crack cocaine use than whites or Hispanics. You know what? I'll I'll accept those numbers because it comes from the study, but I'm going to tell you that it doesn't matter what your race is. If you're smoking crack cocaine, I don't care if you're white, black, purple, yellow, or green. Crack cocaine is the most ridiculously addictive drug that, to me, that's out there. It it's insane. Um, <laughs> people have. Within months of smoking crack cocaine, people have ruined their entire lives and have lost everything. Crack cocaine is ridiculous. And, you know, unfortunately, um, at one point, what I can share with you, because I do know about this, and I was going down to Washington Heights and buying it in, in, in minority areas where I kind of stood out as a white person, but it wouldn't stop me. I wanted my cocaine. So I would, I would go in and, and I would go there to, to, to buy. But you know what? At the end of the day, the, the, just the desire of wanting to use it, 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 it becomes a part of you where you it, it just becomes a way of life. And so when you are in this population where people are struggling, um, people are seeing drugs dealt in their neighborhoods. And you know what? Not that low-income areas are the only place that um, have drug dealers or that African-Americans are the only per- people that live in low-income areas. None of those two things are true or exclusive, but a majority of the people that have been around the selling it's been inner city, and that happens to be one of the ways where you can make money and get yourself out of your situation is dealing drugs. So, you know, unfortunately, it, it, it has an adverse and even higher impact on a population that is struggling financially. And in addition to that, there are short and long term effects. So there are physical health problems and you know, with, no matter what your color, but it seems that within the black and African American community, kidney damage, liver damage, heart problems, and cancer are some of the biggest effectors and um, some of the things that, that are most concerning. Um, of course, there's mental health problems, depression, and anxiety. But then here's another factor. African Americans are incarcerated due to drug related offenses at higher rates than other ethnic groups. So, this is part of systemic problem of what is going on. And African Americans may be at a higher risk for other consequences, but they tend, African Americans do tend to have lower rates of alcoholism than whites and Hispanic Americans. Those that are addicted to alcohol are more likely to experience serious problems. We mentioned that before. But African Americans who abuse drugs and alcohol may experience, like I said, the physical consequences. They have disease transmission and uh, there's all kind of infection diseases. It affects all colors and races. Then there's violence. Alcohol abuse is related to higher rates of domestic violence among African American couples. So um, the numbers are out there 
And you know what? I don't have to break it down much more than this. Um, yeah, it, it, it's hurtful. It's disappointing to see people living in poverty. I don't care what race they're in, but just systematically, the system is that's how we deal with things. And so there are barriers for African Americans to get treatment. Um, some of the things that that affect the culture is and and. It goes to all cultures, but again, specifically, unfortunately, the numbers and, and the things that I'm reading, there are less African-American therapists um, who may be more, who have been or may be more successful with dealing with African-Americans. Not that an African-American wouldn't do good with a white therapist or a white patient wouldn't do good with an African-American therapist. It's just all these different things. And obviously cost, insurance, lack of insurance all plays a part of this. We're going to give you some places that will help you. You don't want to go away. You're listening to the Alan Charles Show live on the BBM Global Network at TuneIn Radio. We'll be right back. Escape from Hell, A Woman's Story is a passionate book that tells the true story of author Rhonda Knudsen's journey through the darkness and adversity of abuse. The book takes readers on an emotional trail from the depths of despair to the heights of forgiveness and understanding. She was inspired to help others, and her book is a vital tool through this process. Faithful to God and devotional to her beacon of hope, Rhonda Knudsen is a perfect example of finding a guiding light that helped her come through the dark and into the light. Her book can assist you in overcoming your challenges with abuse. The publication of Escape from Hell, A Woman's Story is a triumphant achievement and it can help you take ownership of your own experience of abuse and come through stronger than before. Rhonda is currently working on two more books, Shadows of Corruption and Coast to Coast on a Piece of Toast. To read more about this inspiring author and purchase her books, visit RhondaKnutson.com or go to www.amazon.com. Global Glory, that's the work of Dr. Marina McLean, COO of Global Glory, whose calling is to serve God. A first-generation British-born Londoner of Jamaican descent, Dr. McLean inherited the hunger for the Word from her father, who was a Bible teacher. Growing up, her home was filled with missionaries from the Caribbean islands and America, and she travels the world preaching the gospel. She has a Bachelor of Arts degree in theology and an honorary doctorate of divinity and Christian counseling from Friends International Christian University. Dr. McLean is also a songwriter and recording artist, and her songs are written during summits and conferences in the presence of God. She's recorded three worship albums to date and is in ministry for 28 years alongside her husband, Dr. Rennie McLean, who shares her passion. Visit www.globalglory.org or on Facebook at Global Glory. Call 866-244-5679 and feel the glory. Welcome back to the Alan Charles Show, live on the BBM Global Network and TuneIn Radio. And I'm your host, Alan Charles, and I am glad that you were here today with me. Uh, we spoke quite a bit about the disparities and the lack of some treatment for um, minorities, specifically black and African Americans. Um, both the ability to get to a rehab as well as a desire to get to a rehab. So I just want to finish up with some numbers, and then I am going to pass some information on to everybody. So let's see here. There, as I shared, disparities in access to care and treatment for black and African-American people have persisted for, for a long time. The implementation of the Affordable Care Act has helped to close the gap in uninsured individuals, 11.5% of black and African Americans versus 7.5% of white Americans were still uninsured as of 2019. Um, also, 
58.2% of black and African American young adults, 18 to 25, and 50.1% of adults, 26 to 49, with serious mental illness, did not receive treatment. Nearly 90% of black and African American people over the age of 12 with a substance use disorder did not receive treatment. So the numbers are there. Let me give you a couple of facilities that I would like for you to write the website or you can just put down the name and then you can go back and and Google the information. So the first one that I am going to give you is a drum roll is the Boris what is this? Boris Lawrence Henderson Foundation. The Boris Lawrence Henson Foundation. So that's B O R I S L, the letter L like Lawrence, and then Henson, H E N S O N, foundation.org. Again, B O R I S L H E N S O N F O U N D. A-T-I-O-N. And that foundation, if you're familiar with the name of Taraji Henson, Taraji P. Henson, Taraji, what a wonderful actress. Um, God, that she was on something, and, and I'm, God, it was on Channel 2, and it was about... Um, <laughs> kind of like the CIA, the FBI, they created machines that can tell... When people are going to get hurt or get killed and being attacked, it was, I forget the name of the show, but it was tremendous. I love uh, Taraji. So her foundation that she helped set up, that's one of the places you want to help out. The next person is, um, it's called providers.therapyforblackgirls.com. And it's a reference tool. There are therapists that you can search in your area. I searched the New York City area. I wanted to make sure that there were actually people, therapists there. And there were 197 listings in the New York Tri-State area. So, again, it's providers.therapyforblackgirls.com. And there are other things out there. Google, uh, just want to thank you for being here tonight. Uh, Next week, we'll open the book on my book, Walking Out the Other Side, and I will tell you another entertaining story. Thanks for listening tonight. I'm here to help you. You listen to the Alan Charles Show live on the BBM Global Network. We'll see you next Thursday. Good night. He used to be an addict, now he's substance free. Telling all about his crazy journey. This has been the Alan Charles Show with your host, Alan Charles. The views and opinions expressed by Alan Charles and guests on the Alan Charles Show are solely their own and do not necessarily reflect the opinions of the BBM Global Network or its affiliates. Even though Alan Charles thinks he's an expert at life, we urge you to think about acting on his advice. Even though he has been in recovery for 10 plus years, he is a bit of a mashugana. He's given us the real story, the Alan Charles Show. Ups and downs, losing jobs and the glory, the Alan Charles Show. He helps others avoid that purgatory, the Alan Charles Show. been listening to the bbm global network the ideas views and opinions of this broadcast are those of the participants of the program and are not necessarily the ideas views and opinions of the bbm global network company